What's up everyone, today we talk about this, and this. Alright guys, so I actually recorded this video yesterday, and I managed to record the entire thing without my microphone being plugged in, so this is actually round two. So I'm going to be honest, I'm not going to be as excited this time because I used all my energy the first time I made it, but here we go anyway. This is going to be a video about how to think about literature and life with some depth, and then also how to translate that depth into writing, which is kind of interesting because one of the ways that you can think deeply is by writing. So we're going to learn how to think deeply by writing and write deeply by thinking with depth. Does that make sense? All right. So here we go. So basically the goal of today is to be able to have you do this whenever you read any kind of good literature and also to have your teacher do this whenever they read whatever you wrote about that piece of literature or art or movie or whatever. This, however, is not the kind of depth that I'm referring to. So the analogy that I like to use when talking about thinking about depth and writing with depth is a swimming pool. So you have multiple depths within a swimming pool, obviously. We have the surface and then all the way down to the deep end where none of you were allowed to swim because you're too young. The easiest and most superficial version of thinking and writing is at a literal level. So we'll talk about this, exactly what it means in a minute, but for now you can just think of it as the surface of the pool. Slightly deeper in the pool is the inferential level. Uh, this is where you do something called inferring or making inferences. Again, we'll talk about that in a little bit. And the final level of depth we hope to get everyone to in English is the interpretive level where you start to interpret the literature. Now, I would say that in grade 10, which is the primary grade I'm teaching right now, about 60 to 70 percent of my kids are in, in between literal and inferential levels of thinking, whereas I feel that all grade 10 should really be able to infer. By the time you're in grade 12, you should basically be writing at an interpretive level consistently. And if you're not, you're probably not getting a great English grade. If you're one of those students that does really well in like social studies, but can never get a good English grade, I can almost guarantee you that this is the thing you're missing. You're missing depth in your writing. Social studies does not require a deep analysis of literature the way that English does. Although if you have a good socials teacher, they could probably pull it off. So let's start off talking about what the hell these things mean. So let's start at the literal or surface level of thinking and writing. So the examples that we're going to use today are two self-portraits by two different artists that painted in two separate art movements, about a hundred-ish years apart. Now, I'm going to be honest, the first painting I found a couple of months ago when I was doing an in-depth study of realism, which is the type of art that it is, but I actually can't find the painting anymore, no matter how hard I try, and trust me, I have googled every single variation of man with hat and red scarf that you could possibly imagine in multiple languages, and I cannot find this piece of art. So. If somehow you manage to find this piece of art, please link it in the description, because I am desperate to find out who it is. Based on what I recall, this is a self-portrait of the artist that painted it. If it's not, we're just going to pretend that it is for now, okay? Just deal with it. We're going to do kind of like a compare and contrast essay in this video out loud between this self-portrait done in a realism style and this self-portrait of Salvador Dali, who is one of my favorites. If you don't know who Dali is, check this out. That should tell you pretty much everything you need to know about him. This is a self-portrait of him done in his art style, which is surrealism. Now you'll notice that realism and surrealism have something in common in the name. However, they have very little in common in terms of style. Now when I give these two paintings, I often give a brief mini lecture about the differences between realism and surrealism because one of the things you have to do in order to be able to analyze art and literature and think at a deeper level is have a little bit of research and back information. You guys aren't going to get that in this video. If you'd like to, definitely go watch some videos on surrealism. There's a card that'll appear up in the corner here in a second. That is a really good video on what surrealism was all about if you want to be a little bit more informed. Now that being said, we don't need to know anything about these two painters or their art styles in order to analyze these two pieces of art at a literal level. Now I'm going to give you guys 10 seconds with some sweet music to carefully analyze these two pieces of art. So take five seconds each and try and memorize as much as you can about the two paintings so we can compare and contrast the different types of art that they are. Ready? Go! All right, stop. It's time to stop! So, a literal level of analysis of those two paintings, we could say that 
both have light and dark colors in them because there's sort of some dark shadows going on in both of them, but also a lot of light highlights. So there's some contrast in light and dark going on in the paintings. Also, obviously, both of them are self-portraits, at least I think one of them is, but let's just pretend again for now. Both of them are old, and both of them are paintings. So this is not a particularly deep analysis of these two pieces of art. It's very literal. Basically, literal means if you look at the two pieces of painting, right away you can see the differences. They're both paintings. Like, that is the least deep thing that I can imagine. And I have students write this kind of stuff all of the time on tests and assignments. This thing was a short story, and this thing was a poem. Like, obviously. So literal is kind of like, duh, obvious. And you don't want to be writing at that level, and you don't want to be thinking at that level. So that's the literal or surface level understanding, both in thinking and writing. The next level down, which is the level that I really think everybody can get to, and I think it's a skill so you can learn it, is the inferential level, which is slightly deeper. So we're going to spend some time now talking about what it means to infer stuff. Before we do that, however, we need to know something. We need to understand the difference between inferring something from someone and implying something to someone. Basically, what does infer mean? What does imply mean? Because they're very related words. One of the ways that we can understand words better is to break them down into their constituent parts. This is called etymology. It's where you look at where words came from, and you can actually understand a lot about words based on where they come from. So imply comes from two Latin words. Im, meaning in or within. I'll give you a second to think about where you've heard the word ply before. That's correct. Toilet paper. It actually means to fold in Latin. So here we have two words baked into one that literally means to fold within. And we're going to use the idea of folding within to create an analogy to help us understand what implying means or what implication means. This is basically what implying is. Now we're going to do something a little bit strange here. Imagine I have a piece of paper and I have an envelope. We're going to write the actual message that we're delivering to someone on the envelope and we're going to write something else on the paper. Then we take the piece of paper and we fold it up and we put it inside the envelope and we send it to somebody. The envelope will tell them what it says on the outside, but the actual meaning will be hidden or folded within the paper on the inside. So for example, if on the envelope I wrote, you're stupid, but then on the piece of paper I wrote, I love you, and then I folded it up and put it inside of the envelope and then gave it to a pretty girl, they would read it and be like, what the hell, man? But then they would open it up and see the meaning folded within and be like, oh, I get it. Because oftentimes when we're teasing somebody, we're actually telling them that we love them. That's one of the ways that we show love is by teasing. But from the surface, it wouldn't seem like you actually like that person. It would seem like you're teasing them. But the implication within that teasing is that you like them. You could also kind of think of it like this. If you wrote a secret message on a piece of paper and then folded it into a paper airplane, like again, I love you, and then you threw that paper airplane at someone's face, they might be offended until they unfolded the message and read the message within. Let's take it from weird paper analogies into the modern age. If I sent someone a text message like this, they'd be like, aww. But then if I sent them this face immediately after, they would be offended. Why would they be offended? Well, because the actual literal words don't match what I implied by the picture. The literal words say I like your outfit, but the implication of the picture is that I actually don't like your outfit and it looks stupid. So here we have a message folded within some words. The literal words don't say the message, the message is hidden within the picture. You can also kind of imagine it like this. Paint with his face! Yale now on the prowl to take the lead! And Carolina setting up what is bound to be a devastating return, and here it comes! Oh, oh no! Nice. Of instant replay! Wonderful save here, just complete sacrifice! The ball flies right past the blockers, into Sterling's awaiting face, back over the net, and then right back to Sterling's face like an obese homie pigeon! That Oh, Scott. Now, why on earth are we talking about any of this? Well, we were trying to figure out what it means to infer. Well, imply is related to infer in a very specific way. You imply something to someone. It's impossible to imply something from someone. You can only imply to, you can't imply from. That's like trying to catch something to someone. You can't catch to someone. You throw to someone, you catch from them, unless you're Scott Sterling. They catch from you. So you got to think of it like this. To imply is to throw, to infer is to catch. But you're not catching physical objects, you're catching meaning. So now that we understand what the difference between imply and infer is, we can talk about inferring a little bit. If I were to use a different word for infer, I would substitute deduce. And that's basically an educated guess based on clues. You kind of got to pull some Sherlock Holmes and be able to try and figure out what someone is saying without them actually saying it. So one more time, if you remember nothing else from this video, remember this slide. A speaker implies, a listener infers. 
when we're reading a piece of literature, we are not implying from the literature. We're inferring from the literature. We have to infer what's going on underneath of the literal level. We have to try and figure it out based on some of the clues that the author intentionally or unintentionally included. Imagine I sent a text message. And in this text message, I had no hidden meaning whatsoever. I just sent a message and it literally said exactly what it said. I wasn't trying to say anything else. So there's no implication, no implying in my text. And what I said was, hey, want to go out later? So there's no implication there. I'm not saying anything. I just want to know, do you want to go out later? And then let's say that person responds this to me. Uh-oh. What does that mean? K with a period? What did I do? What did I say? And then you start retracing all the terrible things you might have done or said in the past, all of the DMs that you might have sent people that weren't them. Uh-oh, now you're in trouble. Well, wait a minute. When they sent the letter K, did they imply something? How do you know? Maybe they're just saying, all right, let's go out later. So what you're doing now is you're inferring meaning. Let's just pretend that they had no ulterior motives. They just wanted to say, all right. You might ask, well, why'd they put the dot there? I'm like, okay, I don't know. Maybe they just don't know what that means. But what's happening here is not that they're implying something to you. You're inferring something from what they said. You think they're mad at you because they said K with a dot. That's inferring. That's why inferring is useful. Now, you might think like, okay, Kozak, like, this is just dumb literature crap. Well, no, it's actually not. Inferring is extremely useful. In fact, I would argue that the majority of my job is inferring. If you're in my class, you'll know that I ask question of the day all the time. And one of the main reasons I actually do that is so over a period of time, I can gauge how a student is feeling. So if I have a particularly talkative student who one day doesn't answer the question of the day, I might infer from that 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 student's having a bad day. It's kind of like a litmus test. It helps me figure out how you guys are doing that day. So inferring is a very useful skill. It can tell you about people before you even get to know them. It can tell you about how someone's day is going. It can tell you about whether or not you should date that person. Inferring is an extremely useful skill, far more useful than a lot of the other skills you'll learn in school. So this isn't just meaningless English crap. This is good stuff. So let's take a look at a picture and see if you can infer what happened here. Ready? I'll give you five seconds. Go. No? Well, what actually happened was she got ironed in the face. And now you might think, Kozak, that's a really weird example to show us. Well, the reason that I tell you this is because this actually happened to me once. And someone actually figured out what happened by inferring. So when I lived in America in the Midwest, a buddy of mine and I were wrestling in the hallway of the school where we were going. And in this hallway, there was a whole bunch of ironing boards where you could iron all of your clothes. So that it was like communal ironing boards. And while we were fake wrestling, he threw me up against the ironing board and he grabbed an iron and was going to press it to my face as a joke. Now, it wasn't plugged in, so he didn't think it would hurt. What he didn't know is that someone had just used the iron like... 10 seconds before and he pressed it on my face and it gave me an iron burn from here all the way up to here. Now he pulled it off right away so it wasn't a really deep burn but it actually left an iron mark on my face. Not quite as bad as this obviously but it left an iron mark on my face. The next day we went to class and he said to our teacher hey guess what happened to Kozak and she looked at my face for like four seconds and said Cookie pressed an iron on your face and we all just burst out laughing because it was so funny. So she had inferred what had happened based on the shape of the mark on my face and knowing my buddy Cookie and me. So inferring is a very useful skill, if not at the very least to be able to figure out when someone has been ironed in the face. Let's do a practice real quick. Let's see if you're any good at inferring. Can you figure out what is going on in this picture by inferring? I'll give you a couple of seconds to study the picture again. <laughs> Alright, so let's look at some of the clues that we see. Here and here we have some clues. There's something here in his ear and we see that it's connected here all the way down to something on his chest. What might that thing be? Given the age of the photograph and we know it's old because of the colors and the graininess, it looks like it might be some kind of old school hearing device. Well, if it's an old school hearing device, why might his face look like this? And we know that he looks surprised because we could intuit what surprise looks like. Based on the age of the photograph, what's going on, the different clues like the hearing device that we see, and the look on his face, can you infer what's going on here? That's right, he's hearing for the first time. Not that it's intentionally a piece of art, but it is a piece of art because it's captured something beautiful. And here's the important part. It didn't throw it in your face. You had to infer what was going on. And the moment you figure out what's going on, there's this beautiful moment where you can experience the art through inference. And that's what makes art so sweet. And what's actually truly beautiful about this picture, this child isn't hearing just anything for the first time. He was born deaf and he's actually hearing his mother's voice for the very first time. 
So it's a remarkable picture because it's so beautiful on so many levels. And that's why inferring is so cool when it comes to art and literature. So you need to be able to learn to do this all on your own. Kids can do this all the time when I guide them through it in class and we look at something or I talk about a picture like that. You guys follow along and you're like, oh yeah, okay, I get it, that makes sense. But if I just give you a piece of literature like a book or a poem or even a movie and you watch it and I ask you to infer meaning from it, only about 10% to 20% of the kids that I've ever taught can do this on their own without training. So that's why I'm teaching it to you now so that you can start to do this on your own. So if we go back to our self-portraits of these two artists, what can we infer about them? So I'm gonna ask you a question here. Instead of answering this directly, I want you guys to to figure it out. And we're going to take a little bit of a different approach here. Instead of trying to figure out what the artist was trying to say, which is the next level of meaning, try and figure out if you can learn anything about the artists themselves. So if you had to guess, if you had to infer based on the clues here, what do you think this artist was like? Now compare that to what you think this artist was like. The guy on the left was obviously a really serious guy. Look at him. We can infer that based on not only the picture itself, but the style of art that he chose to write in, which was realism, a very serious style of art. Do you really think the guy on the right, Salvador Dali, was a serious guy? Look at the painting. So we just learned a little bit of inferring there. I truly believe that everyone, almost all students, can get to the level of inference by the time they graduate high school. And even if you don't go on to study literature or even go to university, as I discussed, it's a useful skill. This last level of thinking is sort of the deepest level of critical thinking when it comes to literature and art and also your own writing. And it's the hardest one to accomplish. Part of the reason that it's so difficult is it's a skill, like inference, but it's also a talent. And without both skill and talent in literature, you're not going to be able to do this. So if you're someone who hates English and you hate literature and you hate doing this crap, you're honestly probably not going to be able to get to this level. And that's okay. You're probably good at other stuff. I have a grade 8 math level. I don't care. I'm bad at some stuff. I'm good at some stuff. I happen to be good at this. Guess what? It's not super useful, but I love it and it provides meaning in my life. So great. If something else provides you meaning that you're good at, great, man. Do that. Don't feel bad that you suck at English. Anyway, you suck at English. Let's go down to the deepest level. Let's go down the rabbit hole and go into the interpretive level. Now the interpretive level is quite easy to understand in terms of what it means. It just means to interpret the literature. And there's many, many ways you can interpret literature. You can look at different themes in the book. So that's kind of like, is this about war or is this about peace or about environmentalism or global warming or love or death or whatever. You could look at the commentary that the author was making. Maybe he was commenting on the society that he lived in. Maybe he thought it was a bad society and he wanted to write a book about that, but he didn't say it directly. He just sort of commented on his society through the literature. Maybe you want to interpret the message that the author had for his readers. Maybe he said something like, you know, Life is meaningless and suffering, so just deal with it the best you can. Maybe that was his message. I don't know. You could interpret the different symbols that the author put in there. And for me, the deepest level of literature understanding is being able to look at the characters, the symbols, the plot, the storyline, and the evolution of those things through archetypes. If you don't know what an archetype is, there's a great video up there somewhere that you can click on about what archetypes actually mean and what they do. It's super cool. So, how do we interpret these two paintings at a deeper level? Well... Here's the hard part. In order to successfully interpret art and literature at a deeper level and think about them at a deeper level and then write about them at that deeper level, you have to do some research. You need to know more about the artists themselves. You need to know more about what they were writing about and why they were writing about it. You need to read it up online. Maybe you could read some additional texts. Maybe you could read some stuff from the author himself. Edgar Allan Poe, for example, wrote a huge book about why he wrote what he wrote. Well, that would help, wouldn't it? Or you need to discuss it with your teacher and listen in the class discussion. A lot of this stuff will be unraveled as you discuss it as a class. If you can't find anything, there's tons of videos by like the wisecrack called Thug Notes, for example, that you can watch to understand some of the deeper analysis. However, if you don't have any of that stuff available to you because it's a test or something, you kind of have to use your imagination. Imagination. So recently a student wrote for me an analysis of the picture on the left that was incorrect, but he tried really hard to prove that it was true. If you can state something and then support it with evidence, you're never completely wrong. And because he was in grade 10 and attempted to get down into that interpretive level, I gave him an A on the assignment. Well, what this student said was that the hooks and the staves in Dali's eyes represented people who supported him. And you can see where he got that idea from because the hooks and the stabs are supporting the face. And because the face represents the character, he thought maybe the, the hooks and the stabs represented people who supported him. This is a super cool interpretation. It's not necessarily correct, but it's an interesting thought process. 
And he figured that out by writing about it. He didn't just sit there like this and think, what do the hooks and the stabs mean? What do the hooks and the stabs mean? Oh my gosh. He just started writing and it came to him. This is because one of the single greatest ways to get to this level is just to write about it. This is why we write in English, by the way. It's to help clarify your thinking. The main reason that you should write stuff down, and I'm not just talking essays like the reason that you should journal, the reason that you should keep a list of your ideas and thoughts, is because it helps you to straighten out your thinking and clarify your thought process. It's really cool. Most of our ancestors wrote journals, by the way, and it really helped them clarify what they thought about different things as they wrote about it. It took them time to write and they could reflect and analyze about what they were writing about and writing on. That's what happened with this student. They were writing and it came to them. So cool, man. Start writing. Stuff will come to you. That's why you write. Now, that being said, he was incorrect in the sense that that is not what Dali meant, but he was correct in the sense that he made an interpretation and then supported that interpretation with evidence, and that's exactly what I wanted, so A plus to you. Now, we aren't going to spend any time giving an in-depth analysis of the other painting, primarily because I can't find it, so I can't really do it, but on top of that, this video is long enough. So, you need to learn to think and write with depth. Not literal depth, but both inferential and interpretive depth. Now, just really quick before I finish the video, that doesn't mean that you only need to write at a deeper level. Sometimes you need to write some literal stuff down so that you can infer from the literal stuff and then interpret from your inferences. Sometimes you got to walk down the ladder. It's not like your entire essay has to be all inferential or all interpretive. Whenever you give evidences for your writing, that's literal. If you say the part in the story where the character did this, well, that's literal. But then interpret what you wrote literally at an inferential or an interpretive level. Alright guys, so that's how you write and think with depth. Now, writing and thinking with depth, in my mind, are basically the same thing. And I hope that you guys can do both, or the one thing. Anyway, as usual guys, I make these videos for you. Please hit me with a thumbs up, a like, a subscribe, whatever. Leave a comment down below, let me know what I can do better next time, what you'd like me to teach on, or whatever, doesn't matter. And as always, I do this because I love you guys, and I want you to be successful in my class, in school, and in life. Peace. It's time to stop! It's time to stop, okay? No more! Where the f are your parents? Who are your parents? I'm gonna call Child Protective Services! It's time to stop!